Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our weekly Torah class where we like to inspire and learn together. We always like to start off with giving because how we give, that's how Hashem will give to us. So let's give generously so Hashem can and will give us generously. So I'm going to put a couple of coins in the tzedakah box. Please join me from home. And I'm going to ask everyone if they can get their tehillim um, so we could pray for the hostages and pray for our brave and amazing Chayalim, um, the IDF, all the most amazing young men and women, and you know the reserves, everyone that's serving and that are in Gaza. So we're gonna say a couple of names and then I'm gonna say Psalm 20, Kapitel Chaf. So we're gonna say Refua sorry about that. We're gonna say Refua Shalema for Hana Yente Ripka Bashendo. Hannah Bela Bas Devora, Razel Bas Hadas, Mordechai Ben Rachel, Rafal Chaimer Ben Sima Chasha, Devora Leah Bas Yafaliba, Yosef Ben Devora Leah, Hannah Leah Sarah Bas Pesha, Pesha Gittel, and everybody that needs. We're also doing this in merit for the complete protection from Hashem for um, these brave soldiers, the ones that I know by name, and we're including everyone. Rafal ben Devora Lea. We're also say Rafal ben Devora Lea, Yisrael Ephraim ben Chayatzivya, Reuven Chayim ben Nechamadina. We're also praying for an IDF soldier who was injured, Shacha Yisrael ben Roni. May he have a complete refuah shalema. So we're going to start off with Psalm, with Psalm Cha. Lama tzeach mizmar le David, yan cha adinai biyayim sarah. Yisagevcha shem elehe yakayv, yishlach ezracha mi kaidesh. Umitsian yisadecha yiskar kol min chaisecha ve elascha yidashna stella. Yitain lacha chalva vevcha vechol atascha yimale. Niranina bishua secha uvishem elehinu nidgal yimale adinai kol mishalai secha. Ata yadaiti ki haishia adinai mishicha ya neyu, mishme kachai vigurai seisha yiminai. Ela Varacha the Ela Fasusem Banaknu Bishem Adinai Lehinu Naskir. Hema Karu Minafalu Banaknu Kamnu Minisaidad. Adinai Hashia Hamelach Yanehnu Biyam Karenu. Um it's known the Baal Shem Tov and uh the Semach Sadek both said that if we only knew the power of Tehillim, we would say it day and night. And um we owe it to the hostages and we owe it to our brothers and sisters in Israel to take time out of our day to say say some to Hillim whenever we can because that's the least that we can do um, and increase in our tefillah so we can hear amazing news very soon. Um, tonight, I, I just want to say I also do this class in memory of my dear grandmother, Rifka Dina Bas Yosef Yehuda, I hope you're proud. Chaim Dover Ben Betzalo, to save a life is saving a world, and he saved many. So his neshama should have the highest aliyah. Also, my dear grandmother, who recently passed away, Bela Bas Betzalo. Um, so I'm really excited to have with us tonight a really, really special guest speaker who she wrote a book, even if I'm not, uh, Devori Kreiman. I'm just going to give a shout out to my aunt. Uh, connected me to her, Sarah Schusterman from, um, she's a shlucha from Beverly Hills, California. So I'm very grateful to her for that. We were in touch for a very, very, very long time. And we found a week that worked. Um, when it, when the war broke out, we took a little pause and um, we dedicated it just to what pertained to Israel. Now, what we are doing is each class is dedicated to the safety of Israel and the return of our hostages. And we're learning in that merit. And that's what our classes are dedicated to. So um, I am very excited to have her with us. It's the month of, it's, it's the month of Adar. We actually have two Adars this month and that means double joy. We're meant to have, but how do we have joy when it's such a hard time? Because it's very, very painful for all of us. We're all one and we all feel the pain and it's a very, very dark time, but um, 
happiness breaks through boundaries, enabling what is lacking at present to be granted. That is the Rebbe's, uh, Labavitcher Rebbe's quote. And tonight we have, I read this book. I loved it so much. I laughed and I cried. So you could feel two emotions when you're sad, when you're going through pain. You can laugh and cry. It was witty. It was funny. It was sad. It was heartwarming. It was devastating. Um, but also so many lessons that I was able to learn from Devori. And I'm so happy that she's able to be on our platform tonight to share her story of her pain and how she's able to look as beautiful as she does today and smile, even though she's been through so much. So she's going to share our story tonight. And we're really lucky to have you. So if Devori Kryman, if you can please unmute yourself and um, share your journey with us. And um, I'm sure we're all going to get inspired. Thank you. Can you hear me clearly? We're good. Okay. So I always like to tell this part first. Uh, my oldest grandson, his name is Mayer, and they live in Hendon, which is like a suburb in London. And the first few years when he went to school, he went to this really comfortable little preschool very close to his house. But then when he turned five, it was time to go to, I guess they call it the big boy school, which is all the way in Stamford Hill. It's about 45 minutes to an hour without traffic. And the way that they do it in London is that the school, the yeshiva, got these, you know, the iconic school buses, the red double-decker school buses. So they managed to get one and privatize it. And the plan was that the boys who live in Hendon and in Golders Green will be bussed in and out on these red school buses. Mayor was only five years old. So on the first day of school, my daughter told him that she's going to drive him to school because it's a big building. It's a whole different kind of a setting and that he's going to go home on the bus and she'll be at the bus stop to pick him up. So she drove him to school and right after she dropped him off, she thought, you know, he's so little, he's only five and it's such a big school system and there's so much going on. It really would be better for him if he didn't go home on the bus the first day, if he went home with a car and they could talk quietly and process it. So even though he had already gone in, she changed her mind. She decided she's going to stay and it didn't even make sense for her to drive all the way back home and then come all the way back. So she spent the entire day in Stamford Hill just so that at the end of the day, and she had to make arrangements, Mayor has a younger brother, um, just, just in order that at the end of the day, she can drive Mayor home. At the end of the day, Mayor comes out, all cute, you know, the British school uniforms, and they're all so proper, and he's so adorable. And she runs up to him and she says, Mayor, mommy's here. I came to take you home. And Mayor starts to cry. I want to go on the bus. And she says, okay, you'll go on the bus tomorrow. But today I came to take you home. Mayor cried so hard, his shirt was wet. And the whole way home, every time my daughter tried to ask him, you know, how was school and what did the teacher say? Mayor has his hands over his ears and he's screaming, bus, bus, I want to go on the bus. And I, I, I always tell this because it really, when my daughter explained it to me, I said, I really get it. This is story of my life. Here's what happened. Mayor thought he's going on the bus because we had a plan. That's what they said to him. At the end of the day, you're going on the bus. Mayor wanted to go on the bus. Show me a five-year-old who's never been on a double-decker red school bus, red bus that doesn't want to go on the bus. And Mayor saw the other kids going on the bus. So even though really the plan that his mom had for him was better for him, it was different, but was better if he was so busy, hands over his ears, screaming for what he didn't get. He can't benefit from the plan that his mom actually has for him. And I talk about this a lot because really it's how my life went. I thought it would go a certain way. I wanted it to. I see other people who have it. And my God, Hashem, my God said to me, for you, something different. But if I'm so busy, hands over my ears, screaming for what I thought I would get, for what I wanted to get, for what other people have, I can't benefit from the route that I have. So my husband and I were married 38 years and we got married on an unusual date. I lived in Crown Heights many years ago. There wasn't... <laughs> That many wedding halls <laughs> and everybody who wanted to get married would get married in front of 770 in front of the Chabad world headquarters so you had to book a date and it was hard to get a date so the date that we got it was actually a first time people hadn't done it before um and we rode into the Lubavitcher Rebbe and we got approval the date was before the holiday of Shavuos we generally don't make weddings between Pesach, between Passover and Shavuos, but the three days before the holiday of Shavuos are already considered a time when you could make a wedding because the days before that are days of mourning. But those three days, 
you could make a wedding and now they do it regularly. But in my day, 38 years ago, it wasn't really done. So our wedding was unusual. And because it had to be within those three days, it was actually the Hebrew date is the third of Sivan. Our chuppah, our traditional ceremony had to be late at night. So our chuppah, our actual marriage ceremony was nine o'clock at night, which is much, much later than a typical wedding. And because of that, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who had a schedule, actually arrived at 770 at his office and at the main synagogue during the chuppah, during our wedding, which is just doesn't happen. I didn't know because you know how the bride is all covered up. So I'm going ahead with the wedding. I have no idea until the way it usually works is as soon as, you know, the, the groom steps on the glass, which is in memory of of the, the destruction and of the temples in Jerusalem. And then you lift off the bride's veil and everybody screams mazel tov, mazel tov, and it's all very nice. But that's not what happened by me. By me, the groom stepped on the glass. Somebody yanked my veil off. And before I knew what was happening, somebody was grabbing me by the hand and we were running. <laughs> I just had no idea. And we were running from the place where the chuppah was into the building, into 770. And I just, nobody explained anything to me. And I'm this new bride in my long dress, running, being pulled, basically. And we end up right outside the office of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And I'm standing there. I still have no idea what's going on. And there's a mob and there's chaos. And all of a sudden, the door of the Rebbe's office opens and the Lubavitcher Rebbe is standing there. And the Rebbe turned to my grandfather. My grandfather was a rav. He would sometimes, he was a rabbi who was actually qualified to answer rabbinical questions. And the Rebbe said to him, I have a question for you. Is it allowed for an ordinary person, in Hebrew the word is hedget, an ordinary person to make a bride and a groom who are a king and a queen his messengers to give charity? Because generally the laws of, of royalty in Judaism is that you're not allowed to ask a king to do a favor for you. So what the Rebbe was saying was, I'm an ordinary person today and the bride and the groom, they are a king and a queen, but I wanna give them money to give to charity. I wanna make them my messengers, am I allowed? My grandfather didn't answer because he couldn't answer that the Rebbe is an ordinary person. It's just the whole question didn't, he didn't, he didn't answer it. And the Rebbe asked it again and he didn't answer. And the Rebbe asked it a third time. And the Rebbe kept saying, am I allowed as an ordinary person to make this bride and groom, this king and queen, my messengers for charity? And then the Rebbe turned to us and gave us coins to give to charity on his behalf. And the Rebbe gave us a very special blessing. And then we went on with the wedding. I always felt for many years that this was just like a nice story that the Rebbe came to our wedding. It doesn't happen usually. And then I realized years later, the significance of it. So my husband and I, we had three children in three years, our fourth child before our oldest was four. And we just, you know, large family. That's what rabbis do. We're going to have a large family. But our fourth child was born. He looked perfectly normal, but he was born very weak and they didn't really know what was wrong with him. And the weeks are going by, the months are going by, and this child is just not thriving and with no explanation really. To make a very, very long story short, uh, he got sick, he died. Um, but actually before he died, when he was very, very sick, my husband went into New York to go to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. This was 1992. This is really the last year that anyone was able to really see and talk and hear blessings from the Rebbe. So my husband went to the Rebbe. My husband told the Rebbe the whole story. My husband's telling him that we have a child who's very, very sick, who's getting sicker and sicker. He looks perfectly normal. They're not sure what's wrong with him, but he's weak and he's getting weaker and weaker. And the Rebbe is not giving him any blessings, nothing. And my husband's getting more and more desperate. And finally, this was by dollars. People would line up to get Sunday dollars, basically dollars to give to charity. And most of the time, if you try to talk to the Rebbe, the people in line, they were the ultimate, uh, what do they call them? Not ushers, but you know, the people that stand outside of uh, bars and push people out, the ultimate ones. But the Rebbe, the Rebbe gave him respect because my grandfather was there. So actually nobody stopped my husband and he had an opportunity to tell the Rebbe about the baby, but the Rebbe's not giving him any blessing. Bouncers, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, the Rebbe didn't, the Rebbe's not giving him any blessings. And so, and then the Rebbe picked up a dollar and said to my husband, this is for your wife. So my husband saw that the there isn't a blessing for this baby. So my husband said to the Rebbe, at the very least, we're asking that we have another healthy child. He didn't say children. He said child. That's what came to his head. The Rebbe picked up another dollar and the Rebbe said in Yiddish, so Zayin HaGazunt Kind Be'ita Yobizmane should be a healthy child in the set time and in the right time. And we had no idea. What does it mean in set time and in the right time? A short time after that, the Rebbe had a stroke, the first of a few strokes, and my, my baby died. And we knew the Rebbe gave us a blessing should be a healthy child in the set time and in the right time. And we didn't know. Meanwhile, we had 
Gimel Tammuz. Gimel Tammuz is the date. It's a Hebrew date. It's the third day of the month of Tammuz. It's the date that we lost the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And it's a date that's marked as a very, very strong day among, among Chabad Jews. And actually among many Jews all over the world. And we had a child after our first child that was sick and the child was not healthy. And this time the doctors realized that probably we're dealing with something hereditary, but they still didn't know what, because we had three healthy children before. And we knew we had the blessing of the Rebbe. So we were going to have another child. And when I was pregnant with my next child, the due date of that child was the very first anniversary of the date of the Rebbe's passing, was Gimel Thomas, was the third of Thomas. And that's when I understood what the Rebbe was saying. The Rebbe was saying, you're going to have a healthy child in the set time, meaning not right away, because there was another sick child before her, and in the right time, which is exactly that date. And so I knew she would be okay. To make a very long story short, we had two children after that. They were not well. It turned out in the end that four out of our eight children were sick. Um, and by, only by, when, by the time most of them were born did we know what we were really dealing with. And we knew that it's hereditary. And that's when I remembered. The doctors were saying things like, did you test before? But there were no tests for this. It was a very, very rare mitochondrial disorder. And what it is, and we didn't know this until we were already, you know, we had a family. But... What it is, is that my children are born missing the enzyme in the body that produces energy. And it comes from a sheared mutation for me and my husband. And that's when I understood my husband and I, we're a set. We're meant to be married. No mistakes. The Rebbe was at our wedding. The four children that we had are the four children that we had. They're meant to be here. And the four children that we lost, that was part of our journey together. And it was very important to me and to my husband that we not be that family that people look at us and say, oh, in Yiddish, the word is like never, like, oh, poor them, they have such, such a sick child or poor them, they just lost another child. But over a period of 10 years, we lost those four babies. So basically we were the family that had the four healthy children and the four children who we called the babies who died. We worked at it, my husband and I, we were not gonna raise our four healthy children in a way that, you know, we were the family of the illness and death. The healthy, the healthy child that was born in the middle of all this, the one that was born with the blessing of the Rebbe, we named her Bracha. Bracha means blessing. She became a mom two weeks ago, her first child. Um, and she's our youngest. But our kids grew up and their memories of their home, they don't remember an unhappy home or a home that was really heavily shadowed by illness or death. They remember a home that was, for the most part, joyous and light. I became very involved in education. We raised our kids. Our older girls got married and our son Yossi, we had one son, three daughters. And our son Yossi, he was 23 years old and he started to get into what we call shidduchim, which is dating. Arranged and you know, carefully orchestrated dating. And we had organized, it was a girl that he was seeing in New York and we lived in Los Angeles, still live in Los Angeles. <laughs> and the plan was that it was the it was Simchas Torah, which is a very, very joyous holiday. Now that October 7th happened on Simchas Torah, it's thrown a shadow on the day. But Simchas Torah is actually, it's it's the joy of the Torah. It's the day that we dance with the Torah because we finished the yearly reading and they dance in circles and they celebrate. It's a very, very joyous holiday. So the plan was that right after Simchas Torah, Yossi would fly to New York and he was seeing this girl and it was very exciting. And that Simchas Torah, my husband, he's a male. He does uh, bristim, circumcisions. So he had a bris that was a little bit far. So that he drove before the holiday and he was going to do the bris on the first day of the holiday. And then he was going to walk back. My husband can walk very, very far and very quickly. So the first night of Simchas Torah, the first night of the holiday, I was home with my son Yossi, my 23-year-old, and my teenage, Brachalea, was 15 at that time. And my two other girls were married, they were out, and my husband was away for the night. So we went to the shul, we went to the synagogue for Simchas Torah. And there's dancing, and the dancing is very lively. And my Yossi, he was generally a very shy boy. He wasn't really, um, what's the word? He wasn't so outgoing. He was tempted to be a little bit withdrawn and um, quiet. He was very much of a scholarly kind of kid. But he also had a great sense of humor, and he loved words, and he was just a fun kind of kid, but in a quiet way. But that Simchas Torah, because he was dating and because he was so excited, he was lit. I was watching him dance. And like for every step that everybody took, he was taking two. And he was just this nervous energy. And, you know, Simchas Torah also, if you've seen the synagogue, they have all this uh, kiddush in the back. And it's, it's exciting. So at about midnight, I had had enough. And I went to, to get Yossi. And he comes up to me. And his face is like red. Like, and his eyes are very bright. And my husband doesn't drink. And Yossi never drank. So I had no idea what I'm looking at. So I said to him, Yossi, it's time to go home. And he tells me, he loved to play with words. He tells me, no, I'm having happy juice. I want to stay. 
So I said, yeah, but how are you going to get home? We don't drive on the holiday. And he, we live about 15 minutes from the synagogue. So his friend comes up behind him and his friend looked like he had even more happy juice than Yossi. And his friend throws his arm around Yossi and he says to me, don't worry, Mrs. Kreiman, I'll bring him home. I don't know why I thought it was a good idea to leave one drunkard in charge of the other, but I did. I left them there and I went home. But by one in the morning, Yossi still hadn't come home and I started to get nervous. So I walked back to the synagogue. When I got back, all the dancing is over. By now it was really late. I came back with my, my teenage with Bachalea and we come back and there's just, everyone's gone except for like this few guys in the back of the room and they all look the same from the back, you know, just slumped over dark forms and I'm looking from one to the other and I find Yossi and he's like, he's really gone. I mean, his cheek is like stuck to the tablecloth and I'm tapping him, Yossi, Yossi. And eventually he gets up and he comes outside with me and the ear in Los Angeles at this time of night, it was already early morning, is very, very fresh and crisp. And Yossi, he was still drunk, but he got this like second wind. And he starts to run up and down. If you know Los Angeles, it's La Brea Avenue. It's a big street. He's running up and down the sidewalk, flapping his arms like an airplane. And he's screaming, flight number, whatever, from Los Angeles to New York. And he's screaming the name of the girl that he's dating. We're Hasidic. We don't do that. And then he gets really excited and he somersaults. Now we had bought him a whole new wardrobe, new hat, new suit new shoes because he's dating and he's somersaulting on the filthy sidewalk. It's the middle of the night. My husband's not with me. I'm getting frustrated. So I said to him, Yossi, you're impossible. So he gets up. He looks at me and he says, I'm not impossible. I'm impossible. I'm impossible. And I guess he liked the way that sounded because the rest of the way home, Yossi's dancing backwards in front of me. I'm impossible. I'm impossible. Eventually I get him home. Eventually I get him to sleep. The next day Yossi has to go to the synagogue. It's still the holiday with his weekday suit, his old hat and his Crocs. But after the holiday, Yossi flew to New York. A few weeks later, he got engaged. We flew to New York to celebrate his engagement and we started to prepare for his wedding. A few weeks later, I was a principal of the school at that time. It was a Friday morning. And every day before we would pray, I would say a short little, we call it like a Dvar Torah, like a holy word. And it comes from a book called Hayom Yom, which is like a daily diary written by the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe. And it has like a little saying and it goes by the Hebrew calendar. So it's going to be the same setting every single year on that particular day. So on this day, it's the 28th of the Hebrew month of Cheshvan. And the saying for that day, which I taught to the entire school, it was a junior high school. So it's right before prayers. And I said to them, the saying of that day, which is divine providence. There is no such thing as an accident. There's no such thing as random. Every single movement of every single creature is part of the master plan that God put in place in the beginning of the creation of the world. A blade of grass doesn't move in the wind without it being part of the plan of the creator. How much more so, the Rebbe says there, the movement of a human being. And if you would have stopped me that day after I taught this and asked me what you just taught, that there's no such thing as an accident, that nothing happens without God, do you believe that? And I would have said, sure, of course I believe that. There's no such thing as an accident. A few hours later, I was cooking for Shabbos and my husband called me because the police had called him. Yossi had spent the summer in Costa Rica. He had gone there as a learning director. His job was to teach. He was good teaching classes, but he also got to go on all the trips. And one of the trips was scuba diving. And Yossi, who was not an adventurous kid, not at all a sports enthusiast, but he loved nature. And he had fallen in love with what he saw in scuba diving. And he wanted to go for his certification. And after he got engaged, he was continuing to do it. And that Friday, Yossi was going for his diving certification. And the police called my husband. There had been an accident. Yossi's equipment had malfunctioned and they had to pull Yossi out of the water. And my husband came home to get me and he, together we went to the hospital. And on the way to the hospital, you know, we always, we pray. But I couldn't pray because I was saying the same thing again and again and again. I kept repeating I was saying it to myself and I was saying it to God. And I kept saying, this is not the babies, this is Yossi. And what I was saying was, you know, when something really, really big happens to you, you say, okay, that's my deal. And that's what I thought. My life was divided into two. My children were divided into two. I had 10 years over which I lost four babies. And a lot of that time was spent in the hospital with research, with doctors, with worrying, could we have other kids? Could our children have healthy kids? Would our children be affected later in life? So much, 10 years of this. And I really divided my children neatly into two piles. The four babies, they were sick and they died. The four healthy ones, they survived. And I kept saying it to God, this is not the babies, this is Yossi. 
Yossi belongs to the healthy pile. Yossi lived. Yossi's getting married. This is not the babies. They died. This is Yossi. And I keep repeating it and repeating it and reminding God that the worst thing that ever could happen to me already happened. I lost half my kids. We get to the hospital and they ask us to go into a small room. It's never a good sign when they ask you to go into a small room. And then the doctors come in and they say, we did everything we could and we're so sorry. And just like that, we lost Yossi. And the crazy part was it was almost Shabbos and we had to go back. We just had to leave at that point. There was nothing to stay for. We had to rush back for Shabbos. We come back and we made it just minutes before Shabbos back into the house. And we had set the table before we left. I light a candle for every child. My babies had lived, so I light candles for them. So I come home from the hospital. It's within the hour after we found that the Yossi didn't survive. And I have a candelabra of eight candles, gorgeous. Like we, we bought one for each child, eight candles plus two next to it for me and my husband. So we've got these 10 candles. And when Yossi was a little boy, I had read that if you light um, oils, it's a merit to have a son who will be a Torah scholar because oil brings warmth and light to this world and Torah scholars bring warmth and light to the world. So in, memory, in, in merit of lighting the oils, you'll have a son who's a Torah scholar. So I lit, I always used to light 10 candles plus two oils. I come home from the hospital and there's this candelabra, 10 candles and two oils. And I look at it and I think, I can't, I just can't light it. I mean, it's for a beautiful family and most of my children are dead. I, I cannot light these candles. And then I look at the two oils and I think, yeah, oils for a son will be a Torah scholar. I don't have a son. I cannot light these candles. But here's the thing. We don't do what we call mitzvahs, which most people translate as commandments. We don't do what God asks us to do when we feel inspired or when we understand or when we feel like it. The word mitzvah. And here's another divine providence because the word this this is another one of the hayom yoms of the sayings of the day. This one happens to come out every single year on the same date on my birthday. And what it says is that the word mitzvah comes from the word tzafsa v'chibur. It means connection. When God says to us, do this, and we do it, that's how we connect. Because otherwise, how do we, finite human beings, connect to an infinite God? My hands were shaking so much. I lit those candles because we do what God asks, we do, and that's how we connect. And that Sunday, we buried Yossi in the same cemetery that already had our four babies. We buried Yossi exactly six weeks to the day that he was supposed to get married. And you know, after a burial, there's shiva, and people come, and people talk, and people say things, and yeah, they mean well. I have a whole chapter in the book on, on the shiva, which actually reads as funny, but people try. It's hard to get it right. And all through shiva, I had like one basic thought going through my head the whole time. I knew it wasn't even a question. I knew that there was no getting up from this. It wasn't just that Yossi and I were very close, which we really were. We really got each other. We were very similar, but it was something else. I had this very strong sense that there's only so much that a heart can take. I mean, you break. And I really felt I had gone through so much. I hadn't grown up easy and there'd always been other struggles too. And then when the four babies and we had had, so it was 10 years of it. And I just didn't feel like I could endure, that I could really get up. And Shiva, you're sitting on this, we were sitting on this low chairs and people were coming and people were talking and it actually bordered on the absurd, a part of it, but it was just a very, very crazy time. And all I could think of is soon everybody's gonna go away and they're gonna go on with their lives. And I know that I, I just, I can't. And it was very dark. The last few hours of Shiva, actually the last few minutes of Shiva already at this point, it was Friday afternoon and pretty much everyone had gone home. We were getting up from Shiva very shortly after that. And mostly everyone had left. There was just a few stragglers and we were sitting on a patio and I was thinking, not gonna be able to do it. I'm not getting up from this. And my thoughts were getting really dark to the point that I actually scared myself. And I knew that sometimes you just have to stop thinking. So I turned to the woman next to me, her name is Judy Weingart. She's a professional singer, beautiful voice. And I said, Judy, sing something. She looked at me like I was insane. I mean, we don't sing during Shiva. And I said, I need to stop thinking, sing something. So she got all flustered. What should I sing? What should I sing? So she turned to the woman next to her as a former student of mine. What should I sing? How many songs are there in the world? I don't know, a million, trillion, billion, you know, of all the songs in the world. Here's a song that Judy sang to me in the last moments of Shiva. It's possible. It's possible. Everything is possible. Just keep your mind upon your goal and turn to God with all your soul. It's possible. It's possible. And I saw Yossi dancing in the night 
I'm impossible. And with those words, we, we did. We got up from the, chair, the low chair. We got up from Shiva. We took a step. 13 years. We're going. Truth, really truth, sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes it's just plain too hard. Yossi didn't say it's possible. Yossi said, I'm possible. And that's the whole difference. Really, if you look at us individuals, what are we? We are, in Hebrew, we say a guf and a neshama, a body and a soul. That's spirit and matter. That's an impossible fusion. Because of that, because we have soul, because our whole existence is impossible as souls and bodies. If we tap in to that which makes us who we are, if we tap into the breath of God that we have, if we tap into soul, if we tap into spirit, we can do impossible. We do it individually. We do it as a nation. It says that the Jewish nation is uh, like a sheep surrounded by 70 wolves. And all they want to do is devour her. But great is the shepherd who protects her. It's impossible. Our existence is impossible. Sometimes the pain, the fear, the vulnerability, it's too much. But all we have to do is turn inwards. We are possible. We can do impossible because soul is not limited by this world. The problem is we talk about God and we talk about soul and it's kind of abstract. It's all the way out there. How do we make it real? How do we touch it? So the Holy Baal Shem Tov had a student. Um, they were very, very, very holy men. And one of his students once complained to him and said, I don't feel like God is close to me. Like sometimes I feel it a little bit like God is close and then I lose it. I don't feel God like here or close to me. So the Holy Baal Shem Tov said to him, think about the way that a parent teaches a child how to, how to walk. So the parent stands the child up, and just as the child is about to take a step, the parent goes steps backwards. The child takes a step, and the parent moves away. Child takes another step, parent moves away. And the Baal Shem Tov says, why would a parent move away from the child? And the Baal Shem Tov explains, because the child and the parent want two different things. The child wants what we all want. Pick me up, take care of me, hold me. You figure it all out, right? Hold me. That's what the child wants. But the parent... The parent wants the child to know that he knows how to walk. The parent wants the child to know that he knows how to walk. So he steps away. We walk. Sometimes though, I can only speak for myself. Sometimes even as we're walking, this is me saying, no, no, no. I don't want to walk by myself. I don't want this challenge. I don't want this. When one of my babies was sick, I went to be with her. We shipped, we took shifts because we had healthy children at home. And before I went up to where she was into her room, I went to the bathroom in the lobby. And in the bathroom, there was a sign. You have it in many bathrooms. And it said, baby changing station. I had the sickest baby in the hospital. I looked at that sign and I had a meltdown and I'm crying. I want to change my baby. I'm crying to God at this baby changing station like a lunatic. God, I want to change my baby. I want to change my baby for a baby that works. And I'm crying and I'm crying by this baby changing station. And eventually, you know, you got to stop it. I wash my face. I go upstairs. It was a whole production to hold my baby. She was so, so sick. She was intubated. It was the whole thing. But I, I, I picked her. I was holding her finally with help from the nurses. I'm holding my baby. And my babies looked like healthy children. They just didn't have energy. They lost because they couldn't produce energy. They got weaker and weaker, but they grew at a regular rate. So she was a few months old at this point. Her little face had filled out. Her hair was curling and she was very beautiful. And I was looking at her and I put my finger between her fingers. You know how babies do that? They wrap their fingers like tightly around and she like, she held me. And I had this moment and I'm going to give you a little background so you know. I wasn't such a, what we call in Hebrew, tzadikis. It means like a perfect angelic spiritual being while I was going through this. I was a nervous wreck. I jumped every time the phone rang, which people will do when they have somebody in the hospital, you know, baby in the hospital. I was very angry. This wasn't my first sick baby. I was bitter. I was jealous. I would see other women who were pregnant and think, wow, there they go. They're going to have a baby and it's going to be all nice. And I have these sick children. It was a mess. In that background, I want to give you a very transcendental moment. I'm holding this baby and I have a wow moment and something occurs to me. This is going to sound a little bit absurd, but sometimes the deepest thoughts are the simplest. It occurred to me, we don't get to change the baby. Like imagine your kid behaves badly in school and you tell the teacher, you know what, that kid's too much trouble. I want to change it. Give me a different kid. Like we understand, you know, it's our kid. But I understood it in a very deep way. 
We don't get to change the baby. I understood something looking down at my baby. This was one of the wow spiritual moments that I had. And I understood she is a soul in a body here for a purpose. We can explain the genetics. We can explain the heredity, but that's not it. This is a child here for a reason. Her soul in her body in this world for the time that she's there. And my husband and I, we were the ones chosen to escort this life in. And we knew soon out she was dying. It's not a mistake. And even though I don't know why she came into this world, some souls come in just to suffer. And I don't know why, but I knew this. I knew that I was already then learning lessons. I had to show up every day at the hospital. I had to hold her, sing to her, talk to her, have her feel my touch, feel my warmth. And I wasn't going to get anything back. She's never going to grow up and say, mommy, she's never, nothing. She didn't even know I was, I don't know if she knew I was there, but she wasn't going to give anything back. And still I had to do it. It taught me, and in, not in a negative way, it was a very wow moment, uh, like a forever connection. I sensed like my soul touching her soul and giving with no expectation of anything back, but in a, in a high positive way. And I was always the kind of person that everything had to have a purpose and a reason. And I don't like to waste time. And there I was just basically sitting in a hospital holding a baby who would never really get to know me. And it was, a, I saw it as such a powerful and transcendental time. I saw it as a very, very strong connection. And that's really how it works. If we can bring ourselves to see like what we say, the possible, the soul part, bigger than the limitations of this world. It just helps us to remind ourselves we don't know everything. And I'm a public speaker. I travel a lot. And so I do, unfortunately, too often this kind of routine where I'm going to come into a city during the day for a talk that evening. And so very often it's a 6 a.m. flight. And which means getting up at about 3.30, leaving the house by four, not nearly as glamorous as it might be. And very often I can't pray before I leave the house. It's still dark. So I end up praying in airports. And sometimes, it depends on the time of year and when the sun comes up, I have to pray very, very close to when my flight is taking off. So instead of praying in some private corner, I'm praying in a crowded gate with a bunch of people with whom I'm soon going to be sitting on flight. And, you know, when you pray at home or when you pray in the synagogue, we do these things during prayer and they're just normal. You don't think about it. You know, you're taking steps backwards. We hit our hearts at some point. We bow, but everyone's doing it. Or you're at home, you do it. But when you're doing it in a crowded gate with people all around you, you become a little bit more aware of it. So here I was at this gate and I'm praying and I'm going to some city. I don't even remember where, Atlanta, Chicago, Cleveland, could have been anywhere. I'm going and I'm praying in the air, but I'm bowing and all of a sudden it like it comes to me and I'm thinking people around me must think this is one weird lady. <laughs> and then I thought about it. What is, what is bowing? Bowing is very simple. Really the simple, the most profound concepts are the simplest ones. What is bowing? I have my head, my thoughts. I could tell you what would be a good way for God to run the world. I could also tell you what would be a good way for God to let my life turn out. I can think I got it all right here. What does God say? Bow, lower your head. We don't know. We're looking at things from a this world narrow perspective. And God says, there's soul. There's another life. There's another world. There's bigger. And after Yossi died, because he drowned, for a long time, I had this just like I was kind of haunted. It was like a trauma reaction where every time I closed my eyes, I would see this image. I was not with him when he died. I was home. But I had this image, just I imagined it in my mind. And I would see him like in black water trying to figure out how to swim up. It wasn't accurate. Yossi died in blue water, a beautiful day. Yossi was a very skilled swimmer. He was actually a lifeguard. But I had this image of Yossi struggling in the black water and it haunted me. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't function from it. So somebody suggested a trauma therapy to help just like to refocus me. So I went to this woman, she does EMDR. EMDR, it's pretty well known now. It's called eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. And I'm sitting with a therapist we're talking a little bit. And then she tells me, count backwards from 20. Sounded just silly to me, but I counted backwards from 20. And then she says to me, follow my fingers. And she's doing this. She's making figure eights and I'm following her fingers. And I'm thinking, it's such hocus pocus. This I'm paying all this money for. But here I am. And then she sets up a light bar and she says, keep your head straight. Don't move your head. Just move your eyes and follow the lights. And I'm sitting in front of this light bar and I'm following the lights. And all of a sudden I'm seeing Yossi. I'm seeing him as a little boy on his bicycle. I'm seeing him the way he used to learn. He never learned from one book. He also learned from about 20 at a time, all Hebrew research books. He was very into history and into nature and into just law. And I'm seeing Yossi for the first time, not in black water. And I realize it's very simple. You want the answers, you want the strength, look to the light. But first, 
I understood what she was doing by count backwards from 20 and follow my fingers. First, you have to get rid of the distractions. It's very hard to think of other things when you're counting backwards from 20. Basically, we get in our own way. We distract ourselves. We tell ourselves it should be like this and I have to have it like that. And why this and why her and why me and why not? And we get in our own way. Look to the light, but first get rid of the distractions. Stop the screaming of it should be. Look to the light. What is the light? It sounds like a nice idea. What does it really mean? What is the light? So before God created this world, there was only light. Light is godliness. Light is revelation. Light is the ability to see beyond the limitations of this world. There was only light. But God wanted this world. This is a world of challenge. This is a world where even evil can have a presence. This is a world of darkness. It's a world of difficulty. It's a world of struggle. But in the face of that light, you can't have any of this. The light cancels anything out. There's only goodness. And God wanted this world where goodness is not so revealed. So God rolled away the light. We actually say it in the prayers, in the Myra, the evening prayers. We say he rolled away the light and he made room for this world. What's our job? Our job is to bring back the light. The very first words that God said, the first recorded words are, in Hebrew, it's he are. Let it be light. That's our job. How do we do it? This is not some great spiritual, huge challenge, bring back the light. No. Here's how we bring the light. Minute by minute, choice by choice. We're feeling sad. We're feeling sorry. We're feeling angry. Whatever it is, we do one tiny thing. I do it when I'm not feeling very spiritual. I say, today, I don't feel like it'll really make a difference if I say these prayers. But I could say one line. Today, I'm not feeling very grateful. I'm feeling poor me. I lost most of my children. Poor me. I could still hold food and say, thank you, God, for this food that I'm eating right now. I'm grateful for this because not everyone even has that. Today, I'm feeling upset that so much happened or frustrated. I could still smile at my husband so he doesn't have to go around the whole day worrying about me on top of all the other stuff he has to deal with. I'm feeling deprived. I could still remind myself just to drop that I'm very, very blessed a little bit a little bit, a little bit. And that's how we do it. And I, I have this, there's this lovely poem that I remember reading about people say, well, that's very nice, but I don't feel like that. I, I feel like a broken, smashed. I don't feel whole. And I've learned it's just a beautiful thing that if you think about it, it's about a broken vessel has cracks in it. The cracks is exactly where the light gets in. It's not, oh, in spite of all the difficulty, I will do what I have to do. No, it's because and with the pain, use the broken. And it sounds like some distant concept, but the truth is the more we do it, the more we realize that God actually gives us little bits of light that we can see, small, beautiful glimpses into something very big. I'll give you an example. Every year, for many years before Yossi died, I would go on the Shabbaton. The Shabbaton is like a, a Shabbos retreat. About 100 women in the community, only women, and we would eat, and we would talk, and we would learn, and we would eat, and we would talk, and it's just a nice event. So 13 years ago, I said to Yossi, in the middle of the week, I said, I'm not going to be home this Shabbos. I'm going on my retreat. And Yossi said to me, don't go. I said, what do you mean don't go? I always go. I'm going for, for 18 years. I have to go. I'm sharing a room with someone. He said, don't go. I want you to be home for Shabbos. And I said, I'll be home another Shabbos. I have to go. I'm speaking Friday night. I, I, they're counting. I can't just not go. But he kept saying, don't go. I don't want you to go. And it made no sense to me. I mean, I've done it 18 times before. And I always, I leave some food. They're fine, you know. But it bothered me that he asked me not to go and it made no sense. And I didn't know what to do. Why shouldn't I go? No reason not to go. And I'm going back and forth the whole week and finally pretty close to Shabbos, I made my decision. I stayed home. We had a beautiful Shabbos. It was a family Shabbos. We didn't have any guests. So I wasn't supposed to be there. And we had a beautiful family Shabbos. It was Yossi's last Shabbos. And afterwards, I remember thinking, like, how did he know? What made him ask me not to go? And how did I, why did I listen to him? None of it made sense. But if we're open... And we're ready. Even in the pain, we see bits of God. We see bits of truth. We see reminders. We're not by ourselves. And it's not a random world. God is here. Nothing happens without God. And souls exist at all levels. And there's journeys and there's processes. So you could say, okay, fine. I'll do what I have to do. I'll go through it. I'll accept this God, this soul. But still, it's hard. It's hard. I mean, how do I do it? Because the truth is, it's not enough just to do what we have to do. We really have to do it with joy. 
why is joy so important? I mean, we, we, I'm doing it. I'm doing what I have to do. Let me just do what I have to do. Why do I have to be happy while I'm doing it? And if you see in the beginning, especially in the war, we would see a lot of videos of the Israeli soldiers and they're dancing and they're singing and they're holding each other on the shoulders. And like, you might wonder, I mean, if anyone knows how serious this is, they know. What is it, camp? Everybody dancing and singing and there's guitars. What is that? But the truth is they understand it's a tool. It's a battle weapon. If we go into, into our war, any war, we go into any war feeling heavy and feeling lethargic and feeling hopeless, we don't stand a chance. We need to go into war with confidence and with joy and sure of what we're doing. And that stands for an actual war and our own wars. Many of us are struggling with things that have happened to us outside of us, money situations or loneliness or our own vulnerabilities within us that we feel we have to battle our own anxiety, our own sadness, our own anger, or the stuff that happens to us. It's a war. And if we don't come at it with energy, with purpose, with a sense of mission, we don't stand a chance. It's so, so important. And I was talking before about how we see little messages. I'll tell you another one. Pesach, the first Passover, came a few months after Yossi died. And We'd kind of been stumbling along, but I hit a real low right before Passover because Passover in my house was always very, very big. I used to have my whole family and we just you know, my siblings and their kids. And it was always a very beautiful time. And Passover was when Yossi really shone. I mean, he was just like, just, he loved that holiday. And because we sit at the Seder when we talk and Yossi liked to talk and talk and talk. I'm not sure where he gets that from. <laughs> and Yossi also liked, he was like a funny kind of a kid. And you know how we ask the four questions every year? So when Yossi was a young kid, he got this thing that he started to do where he would ask the four questions in, in Yiddish, because that's our custom to do it in Hebrew and then in Yiddish. And then he would add another language. The last year before he died, he did it in Japanese. And as Passover is coming, I'm feeling more and more sorry for myself. And we knew we have to do something different for Passover. So we didn't host that year, even though we always hosted in our home. That we actually went, my sister was actually on. We went to them in Palm Springs. It's two hours from us. And because my husband was a moel and a busy moel, he had a bris, he had a circumcision the morning of Passover. That night was a seder. See, we took separate cars and I got there ahead of him. And when my husband pulled up later, I see that he's doing this thing he always does. Like he's looking, looking, he's rushing all over the car. And, and he's a very busy man. And I know already. And I come up and I say, Nachman, what did you lose? And I know it's not his keys because we have old fashioned cars. We actually turned the keys on. He just drove there. I know it's not his phone because he had just called to tell me he's coming. I thought maybe it's his wallet. He's looking frantically for something. And he tells me a napkin. I said, a napkin? He says, yeah, I brought it for you. You're supposed to give your wife a gift before the holiday. He's looking for this napkin. And as we're looking, I'm helping him. He tells me the story of this napkin. He says that morning at the Briss, there had been some kind of an argument between the family members at the Briss and the grandfather wanted to intervene, but you know, sometimes if you intervene in an argument, you make it worse. So it's better to have somebody who's an outsider, who's not part of the family or part of the people arguing to, to get everybody to remember this is a happy thing and get your act together. So he called over my husband because my husband is not a family member. He's not a friend. He's the mole. He's working there. So he called over my husband and he, he took a napkin and he scribbled something on a napkin. And he said to my husband, give this to the father of the baby. So my husband takes the napkin. He gives it to the father of the baby and everything goes well. They have the bris. Then my husband tells me at the end of the bris, the bris is over and he's packing up his stuff and he sees the napkin open on the table. The napkin was written in Hebrew. The grandfather was Israeli. Four words on the napkin in Hebrew. And it says, Yosef. My son's name was Yosef. He had one name, Yosef. It says, Yosef, Aymer, the Yais, Besimcha. Sorry, the Israelis for my American accent, but Yosef says to be happy. And my husband said, today of all days, tonight is a Seder. I knew. When I saw that napkin, Yosef says to be happy. I knew I had to take it and bring it home for you. Because we have to find joy. You have to be happy. Even the first Seder without Yossi, we had to be happy. My husband's a great guy. I don't like when he comes in the kitchen. One time after Yossi died, I'm cooking and Nachman comes into the kitchen. I'm making eggplant. And he says to me, why are you using so much salt? And I said, my mother makes it like that. Don't worry, I'll rinse it off. And he says, yeah, but why so much salt? So I said to him, because when you salt the eggplant before you cook it, it takes away the bitterness. And all of a sudden, I'm in my kitchen in Los Angeles, and I feel these white flecks coming down over my head and shoulders. And I turn around, and my husband is holding the salt shaker over my head, shaking, shaking. And he says, to take away the bitterness, you got to have joy. 
It's nice. It sounds nice. How do we do it? How do we do it? How do we find joy? I mean, there are times when we just feel it's very nice. It's a nice idea. It's just too hard. So in my book, I call it even though. And here's how it works. On the day that we buried the last of our four babies, at that point, we knew. Before that, we really didn't know the genetics of it. But before the last baby, we knew. And we knew that we have a 25% chance with every pregnancy for a sick child, a 75% chance for a healthy child. And the problem was that one in four, it's pretty good odds. The problem was if a child was one sick, the child is not 25% sick. The child is 100% sick. So we have these odds of one out of four with every pregnancy, but we knew that when it's a sick child, the toll that it takes on us and on our family, it just was not, not workable. So we knew that there would be no more babies. We knew this was the last baby. And so we buried that baby. I remember standing at the grave and thinking, we're burying all the babies we can't have. And how do you give shape to something that you've never met? How do you grieve something you've never met or held? And it was so difficult. And those I didn't talk about it in those in those days. I'm much older now and I've learned a little bit about life. But then it was a very private grief. Um, but the day that we buried the last babies and the way I like the last baby, the four, number four, and I think of it as the day we buried all the babies we would never have. I was on my porch. We have like a patio and my four kids were with me and my Israeli friend, Fradl. And I was saying that I had read that there's an angel called Metatron. And the angel Metatron learns every day with the souls. This is a heavenly yeshiva. It's a school up by the heavenly throne. And the angel learns every day, the beginning of the day, with the souls of the babies and the children who came into this world and died before they had a chance to do sin. It's a pure souls. And they have this special class with the angel Metatron every day. And that was fine. But then I started to get really upset. And my kids are watching me. And I'm saying, you think the angel Metatron takes attendance? Every day he says, crime in, crime in, crime in. And my kids are getting really nervous and I'm getting more and more upset. And then I start with, and today, today the angel Metatron says, oh, a fourth crime in baby is here. And here's how the angel Metatron takes attendance today. Crime in, crime in, crime in, crime in. And my good friend Frottle Bookets gets up and says to me, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. And we laugh. First we froze, then we laugh. Because my kids also, they were like laughing. We don't say shut up in my family. We still don't say shut up. We don't talk like that. But shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Four times with an Israeli accent you can say. And here's why. Because here's what that means. Even though your heart is broken. And even though today you buried the last of the babies and all the babies and all the terrible things. Even though you feel like the biggest Nebuch, I don't know an English word for it, pathetic person in the world. And even though no one would blame you, even though you can say, I can get away with anything, people depend on you, people love you, and you yourself, your own life is worth something. So even though you feel entitled, no, you still have a life, you get it together, you go on, you find a reason, you find a strength, you find a way to connect to your own strength within you. You share with other people. You gain comfort from each other. You find wisdom in books. You find a way. And I'm going to end with this. People tell me, it's very nice for you to speak like that, they tell me, but I'm not like you, they say. You grew up, we call it FFVs. It means from, from birth, it means religious. You grew up religious, so it's easier for you. I'm not like you. I didn't grow up religious. I wasn't born religious. I'm not like you, they tell me. You're spiritual. I'm not spiritual. You're strong. I'm not strong. You're happy. This they know because I'm wearing lipstick. I'm not happy. I'm not like you. You could do it. You could lose children and you could do it, but it's not true. And here's how it really works. After Yossi died, Chaya held up the book, but that started as a journal. I started to write. I didn't know I was writing a book. God said to me, honey, you're writing a book. What I was doing is I was journaling and I was capturing the messy, I call it the inelegant grief. And messy it was. I was writing down everything that happened, everything everybody said to me, everything I was thinking, and also every story of Yossi that I could think of. I just wanted to capture him. But it became a journal of the process. And when I looked back at it years later, when people started to ask for a book, and I realized I had written one without knowing I was writing it, here's what I found. It was a mess. I was a mess. Crazed stuff. For example, at Yossi's funeral, as they were burying him, my daughter who lives in London, Almost missed it. We tried to hold the funeral off for as long as we could, but it's our it's our custom to bury before sundown. And she just made it into the cemetery. She they with lights and sirens, literally, they 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 took her from the airport and she left her luggage and she came flying. 
And she came as they were burying Yossi and she runs into the cemetery and there's this massive crowd there. And we just gathered, me and my three girls and we're huddling together. And my daughter looks at the crowds and she says, Yossi must be loving all this attention. And we laugh as they're burying Yossi. And in the book, I write that. I want to edit it as I'm writing it and say, no, we didn't laugh as they buried him, but we did. Because the line between laughter and tears is so thin. And I wrote that in my journal. I wrote all the crazy. I wrote how I couldn't sleep at night and I was binging. I was just eating anything I can get my hands on just to fill that space. I wrote how, about I, had, how I had a fight with my husband on Tisha B'Av, on Yossi's birthday, and drove out, pushing the gas down like a maniac. I wrote about how when people spoke to me during Shiva, instead of listening to them, I would count how many children they had. I wrote about how I reacted when someone asked me how many children I have. The answer, by the way, is I don't know. And I wrote all the messy moments. I wrote all the pain. But here's also what I wrote. I wrote my thought process about how do I just even, how do I still remain a mom to a child who's not here? It was different than the babies. Yes, he was 23. And it, it really made me think about soul, not in some abstract, holier than you, beyond this world, spiritual, scholarly way, just in a very real way and understanding that souls never die. How do I remain Yossi's mom? And I wrote about that struggle. And I wrote about the struggle to connect to other people because I was afraid I would never be able to have a conversation with anyone who didn't lose most of their children. How could we ever understand each other? And I wrote about how do I feel close to a God who I really felt had kind of kicked me to the side. And when I look back, here's how it looks. There's no magical moment of crossing over from not happy to happy, from weak to strong, from broken to whole whatever that means, wherever that looks. There's no magical, instant, spiritual becoming. There's moment by moment, thought by thought, one word at a time. And I'm really going to end with this. I once had a meeting and the meeting went into the evening time and I had parked, when I came out of the meeting, I came down to the elevator. I parked my car in the underground parking lot and it was nighttime and I was by myself and I come out of the elevator and the area around the elevator is, is lit up. But the parking lot is dark and I'm scared. I'm alone. It's dark. It's an underground parking lot. But I got to get my car. I have no choice. You know, so for a while, I'm like, I wish I could just stay by the, by the light, by the, by the elevator. But my car is out there somewhere in the dark. So no choice is no choice. I started to walk towards my car. And as soon as I started to walk, light started to go on above my head. It was motion. That's how it works. Nobody wants to step into the darkness. We're frozen sometimes. We're scared. We say, I can't do this. I can't go alone into this darkness. I don't know how to do it. But all we have to do is take one step, do one little thing, smile when you don't want to, give a little bit when you, everything is telling you not to, do one positive spiritual act for yourself, one little kindness, one gentle thing. Take a step, a light goes on. Take a step, a light goes on. And before you know it, there's only light. Wow, so profound. And um, you're so incredible and strong. And, you know, we don't get to choose what happens to us. We only get to choose our reactions in life. And it's amazing that you chose to react. I'm sh it was a journey, but to react with joy and laughter and to make fun of and be cynical, but funny at the same time. Um, your humor in this book, like I, I didn't think hearing you would be as good as your read because it was just so, for me, it was so entertaining yet so heartfelt. And I personally um, had some loss in my life. Um, my best friend passed away when she was 23. Um, her and Ashama should have the highest Aliyah, Hana, Basar, and Leib every single day. Like you said about the Hayom Yom, um, daily experts that the Lubavitcher Rebbe put out. I put it on my status in honor of her and in honor of Miriam Bas, Miriam Hindalea Bas, sorry, Hindalea Bas, Menachem Mendel, two friends that passed away. And it's my way of giving back um, to them because like you said, uh, a soul never dies, a body dies, but a soul never dies. And I'm sure you did so much research on the soul, but I like to um, really hear everything that the Rebbe, the Lubavitch Rebbe says about a soul. And, um, he said, when a, when a body, when someone dies, their body dies, but their, their soul lives on for forever and they're not limited to their body no longer. And the way to keep them alive is by doing special things in their memory on a daily basis. And they actually, their neshama, their soul feels it and they 
they appreciate it and they're thankful because they can't do mitzvot anymore, but we can for them. So yeah. I have I have like two questions. You answered a lot of questions. Um, we spoke a lot before the class. What we're going to speak about, you covered a lot. There's so much more we can hear from you. Um, but I like to ask this question all the time because I believe we come down in this world and everyone has something that's extra special about them. Um, and everyone has their mitzvah. So what would you say was Yassi's special, your son Yassi's special mitzvah that you feel is that stands out he had many but if you feel that stands out and what would you appreciate because we like to take something away it's not just a story that we listen to what would you like for our our viewers and our listeners to take away to add more in their life to to uh elevate your son's holy son's neshama you could say his full name as well thank you his full name would not be just yosef yosef and ben nachman bear because it's my husband. After we after a person dies, it goes by the father. When they're ill, we go by the mother. So it's Yosef Ben Nachman Bear. And it's interesting because while Yossi was alive, the energy that he had was really for learning, particularly halacha, which is Jewish law. That was his passion. It's interesting. It sounds kind of dry, but he wasn't dry. But a lot of what I felt related to him on a soul level is really joy. Because, and I realized that I, like if I would have summed him up before he died, I just would say this was a learner who took, he always loved learning. He was like that nerdy kid, even in vacation. Um, and he really, he liked history. He liked hard facts. He liked, he liked to delve. He liked complicated halachic decisions. You know, he enjoyed that. But I think it always comes back. I start with the learning and then I always end up back to the joy. Um, because we know the halacha, Jewish law, also connects to soul. It's soul work. It's just, this is what God asks of us. And so we do it, but he really took joy in his learning. So I think the most, the, the most, um, what's the word, the most fitting way to honor him really is joy in who we are, you know, as Jews. And I've learned to have joy as his mom. I couldn't have imagined it. I end the book with a letter to him in which I really say that I say, I didn't know. I didn't know that I could still find a way to be a mom. I didn't know. But now, now I, I very much feel it. It's a soul relationship. It's not what we envision, but it's very real. And the only way we can do that, joy is joy of the soul. Every other joy really falls apart. So I would say that there's two. There's the learning, which he took very seriously. Um, particularly, he took it seriously as far as this is my obligation. Here's what's expected of me. He was very real about that. Um, but I think joy in our mission, not a sense of, oh, I got to do this, or it isn't fear, but I have no choice, more of, I was created for this, it's my sole purpose, and that's really the biggest joy anyone can have, is fulfilling purpose, soul. Wow. Um, so that's something that I hope everyone's going to do um, today, take that upon themselves to do everything with more joy. Um, add joy in your life, add joy in your mitzvot. Don't just do it, spice it up, make it exciting. Um, like add more spices to the mix. Um, something that I tell people at Shiva, um, but only people that I'm, I feel very close to, um, because when you go to a Shiva house, you're not meant to speak before you're spoken to, and you're meant to be very sensitive, um, to the person, even if it's uncomfortable, but like it's it's a time that you I sometimes you go to Shiva houses and people are are yapping and then I look at the person sitting Shiva and I'm like it's not the time and I, I and I I show the person I'm like later later so I, there's something that I say and I'm going to share it um with you if that's okay and I'll send it to you a little later I actually sent it out on our the whatsapp chats um we have like five broadcasts for our class and then we have ambassadors around the world now that spreads our class, which is so exciting. And tonight we had 97 ladies. So before I share it on live, before I share it, I'm just going to do a little roll call. So you have like a moment now, um, just because it's hard while I'm, I'm saying it, to just write where you're from if you didn't yet. We're going to do a roll call just so it's so cool to see how in like right now it's every, every it's 908 Eastern time. But there's people around the globe that is listening in at the same time. This didn't exist. 20 years ago, um, even 10 years ago, even before COVID, we weren't able to do this. And it's just so amazing how we can make this happen and we can sit together and for bring and learn um, in our homes and add more joy in our homes. 
So I'm going to ask everyone to request that tonight, um, if everyone can uh, please take something on more for the hostages, um, because they can't do mitzvot right now. Um, and I'm sure they would like to do more mitzvot and they're limited. And hopefully very soon we are going to be reunited with them. And um, we need to be joyous for them because they can't be joyous right now. We need to do whatever we can. I just heard a, a video of the Lubavitch Rebbe today and he said to say more to him. That's what he said in a pretty strong voice. And we have to, he was talking about um, when the people in Iran um, were held hostages because I'm, I'm constantly working on the classes and trying to find um, materials for future classes. So I'm working on something. And I saw that and I was like, wow, because sometimes we're like, nah, we don't have to start off with Tehillim. Yes, we do. Even though it takes time and sometimes it may seem a little annoying and we want to just start the program, we need to stop and we need to take time to pray for someone else. And we need to take time to think about someone else. Um, even if we have another agenda, we have to take that time. So I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and just um, do the roll call because it's very cool and our viewers really enjoy that. Um, so I'm going to start off um, by saying we have Toronto on tonight. Welcome Myrtle Beach. Welcome Los, Los Angeles. So many, so many uh, from Toronto. Amazing. Brooklyn, New York. We have Baltimore. We have Long Island. We have Pomona. We have LA, California. We have Cedarhurst. We have Mexico. We have Flatbush. Uh, we have Philadelphia. We have North Carolina. We have Mexico City. We have Brooklyn Heights. We have Toronto. We have Far Rockaway. We have Crown Heights. We have Surfside, Florida, Palm Springs, California. We have Australia. We have Long Beach, California. We have Ottawa, Canada, Palm Springs, Palm Springs, um, California. We have Kingston. We have literally, it's incredible how how far this class spread and it's so many it's like the Kotel I like to say the Kotel class we have every kind of Jew on here and we are the same there's no such thing the Lubavitch Rebbe said there's no such thing as someone that isn't religious we're all religious and he got very upset when people would use that term of a Jew and say they're not religious um we all come from the same place and um, we just all have work to do and we all, all need to grow, but we, we're all religious. We all have it in us because we all have a Jewish soul and um, we're all connected to God and we have a piece of God in us. So I'm just going to share something that I think will bring comfort to people going through pain of loss. Um, I was at a Shiva house. It was my brother-in-law's childhood friend um, who I knew growing up. So I said, could I share something with you? And he said, sure. And I said, so... Um, years ago, I went for the first time I went snorkeling. I'm not a great swimmer. I wish I was, but if I was a great swimmer, I would be doing all the water sports. And, um, I was so excited to go snorkeling. I had trained, like I had someone by my side helping me. And I was just so blown away by what went on underwater. I was like, wow, I just couldn't get enough. It was there's sea life, you, you know, it, you know, to the eye, it just looks like a bed of water, beauty, beautiful waves and the colors. But then when you go, when you see what's going on under light, under, under the, under the water, you see a whole, a whole nother world that doesn't exist to our eyes and the most magnificent fish and corals and just amazing. I really recommend everyone to somehow get there to do it. And um, then uh, so many people were dying and I love sky art. I love nature. I love flowers. Like all of our, all of our uh, flyers that we send out are all pictures I take on my walks. Wherever I go, I try to see the beauty. There's beauty everywhere. Even in the darkness, there's beauty. And um, people are like, where did you take that picture? I'm like, oh, in Brooklyn. They're like, what? I'm like, yeah, Brooklyn has beautiful places. Um, and Afterlife, people die. People, I like to say pass away. I don't like to say die because dying is final. And um, we see a sky, but behind the sky, there's a whole world. 
and there's artists and there's writers and there's so much going on that we don't see, but things are happening and things are cooking and think like, you know, and that's, I told this guy this and he's like, wow, he was blown away. He couldn't believe it. And I was like, yeah, maybe one day I'm going to make a video about this. And I did. Um, I was just in Israel and I was in Tel Aviv and there was just so much going on there, which is a whole nother for bringing in itself. And um, I took a video of it, which I'll post in the chat shortly. And if anyone wants to see after, I'll share it. But um, we all need to remember that there's life after death and we need to connect to our loved ones. And when we connect to our loved ones, they will connect to us. Um, and the same with a Rebbe. We have a Rebbe. And if we want to, any tzaddik, a tzaddik, a holy person, um, Moshe Rabbeinu never dies, didn't die. His holy, his body died, but his neshama is here. Same with all of our ancestry. We go to Keva Rachel, we, at, we could ask for things. She's our mother. And um, that's why I look at our Rebbe and we can go to his caver. We can, it's in Queens. Um, and we can ask and we can beg for things. And I personally saw miracles and I've, I personally got crazy answers that doesn't really make sense, but there's a whole life. So we just have to know that we have to be positive and do our part. Recently, I was asked to speak to Base Rifka girls, a seventh grade class, and they wanted me to talk about October 7th. Me talk about October 7th. I mean, I'm pretty much struggling myself. So I went in there and we had a whole talk and, um, I said, how bad was COVID? And they all raised their head. And I'm like, and now how bad is October 7th? And we couldn't put a number to it. And we spoke about it and we said, what's our end goal? Our end goal is Mashiach and we need to bring him. And that's that's the only thing that we have to, that's, that's our vision. That's what we have to look forward to is Mashiach and we have to make it happen. Everything else is gonna sidetrack us, sidetrack, get a sidetrack. Um, watching, the news, we all see that everything they posted were lies. Okay. Um, think I'm talking about like the, the news, they, they want us to believe what they want us to believe. Um, the world right now is not in our favor. The Jews, they don't love us very few, but if we stick together like crazy glue, no one can break us. No one. In fact, when I was in Israel, I went to visit, uh, people that got wounded. And in the beginning of the class, we daven for Shachar ben Ronit. He was a soldier that we did a class on all about him. His fiance spoke, but um, he was supposed to die and Hashem gave him life. It was incredible. And if you want to look back or you can reach out, I can send it to you. And I wanted to visit. That was my only mission when I went to Israel, besides what I went for, um, for some simchas and some other things. And I, literally told my husband, I just want to visit him. So he drove me an hour out of the way and they were blown away that I came to visit. No one has limbs in the hospital. I'm talking about nobody, but they had a pretty good demeanor. But then someone next door to him, like in Israel, they have this amazing thing. Each hospital room has a whole like a courtyard where you can go outside and you have like your own porch and, you know, just to breathe. And People would come and volunteer. And I saw this guy and he looked so sad. So I turned over to, I, I looked at this guy, Shahar's girlfriend, I mean, now fiance. And I said, Tamar, should I go over there? And he's, she's like, you came to uplift people, go. So I went over and I had some 12 second bucks with me. And it's known 12 second um, is protection for, for men, women, and children. Um, and when we say the words, it have powers. And the 12 second are, it's from the Torah. We're like experts from the Torah. And um, I went over to him and I'm like, hey. And right before he dismissed a whole group of guys that came to sing for him, he had no interest. And I said, I'm I'm friends with, I'm, I know Shahar. So I already had in because I knew someone. And I said to him, I just want to tell you, like, I'm really sorry what happened to you. And we really care. And he goes, the whole world hates us. And I looked at him, he literally like leg off and he's sitting there with his grandmother and his elder, his mom. And I looked at him and I'm like, you're right. I didn't like tell him, no, you're right. They do hate us. 
but I said to him, I said, but we love you and we have to stick together like crazy glue. That's what I told him. And then I gave him the book and I had like, I had like this Trader Joe's uh, peanut butter, uh, chocolate, amazing. Uh, it's called like a crunchy rice crispy treats. So it's amazing. So I had a box and I took it out and I was giving them out. And um, I gave him the 12 second book and he goes, that's for babies. And I looked at him and I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, babies do say it. That's true. But I just learned. I'm like, only if you want, like, don't, no pressure. And he took it and he was just like, so thankful. It was so cute. It's just a small encounter. But we have to remember like, and, and I'm, I'm connecting this to what Devore is saying, when someone's in mourning, when something makes us feel good, not necessarily doesn't make the other person feel good. So a whole bunch of people came to sing to him, but he wasn't feeling it. He really wasn't feeling it. It wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right venue. You have to do it with, you have to do, you have to have a lot of thought in mind when you're going to comfort someone. And it's not just like saying what's on your mind. And if you don't have the right thing to say, just don't say it. So I'm going to ask Devori, if it's okay with you, um, to share with us, because sometimes we don't know what to say and what not to say. And we only really know what to say and what not to say when we're in a situation ourselves and we go through it. And unfortunately, you went through it many times. And um, very soon, the Rebbe promised that Mashiach coming in our generation, you're going to be reunited with your entire family, your whole family, that when people ask you very soon how many children you have, you're going to know exactly what to answer. Um, but I would love to hear from you what you appreciated, what you didn't appreciate, even though you wrote some of, so much of it in the book. I just want to say, I'm not trying to promote this book like at all, but I, I believe that everyone should have this in their home um, because there's so, we heard Devori tonight, but there's so much that she didn't cover. And sometimes like words have power, but when you write something in a book, like it has even more power and you, you can't even put it into words. So I really recommend everyone should buy it or borrow it because it's, really a great read and you will thank me so if Devori, if it's okay to answer that question because I think now everyone knows someone with loss and like people just say things and it, it could be very hurtful and painful and we don't mean it so if you can let us know what you you would appreciate what you did appreciate and what you didn't so I think that it would be so nice if there was a clear formula you know if it was so easy here's what you do when someone's going through a hard time the problem is it doesn't work like that. First of all, because everybody's different, but also because we're different at different times. So it's important really, the only thing to know really is to make room for the other person. It's very, very hard. We have to humble ourselves because we, we, we're good people. As Jews, we, we're kind and we want to do good. So we come at people with usually, sometimes there was some faultlessness and you know some really big uh, boo-boos, but mostly it was really just people really wanting to help and not knowing how. I write for Ami Magazine. I'm a writer for them. I do a lot of uh, human interest stories. And I've learned in the beginning when I would hear somebody's story and what would go through my head is, yeah, you think that's bad if you only knew, but I can't tell you mine. But then I've learned something when I really listen to people and that didn't come easy for me. I tend to talk more than I listen. And that was my work to learn to just let, make room for the other person. I learned something. First of all, there's no measure. We can never measure how much something hurts or how hard something is or how strong someone is. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to face another person with the willingness to let them be. And it's amazing what comes up. And when you come at something with humility, you just really make room. So the right answer is really to look to the other person and see, do they look like they're in the mood of chatting? Do they? And if not, I think it's a Western culture thing. We're not really comfortable with silence, but it's okay just to let the space sit, to learn if this is the cue that the other person is sending off and there's nothing wrong with asking. I mean, people make fun. Some people say, if there's anything I can do, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a, a humble question of, would it be helpful if I stayed? Or would you prefer being left alone? Just that. And even with all that, there's no preparation. So I brought up Ami Magazine because the last article that I had, well, I think there's a new one since then, but maybe two weeks ago, um, I interviewed Ronin and Orna Nutra. Their son, Omer, is a soldier who was captured on October, 20, October 7th. 
He's turned 22 in captivity. They haven't heard a thing from him. He's the one that was in the videos that they showed, the early videos posted by Hamas. There's one video of a group of soldiers pulled from a tank, and he's seen in that video standing outside his tank. So they know that he survived, and that's all they know. And I did the interview with both parents. I wrote it up. And after the interview, I turned to my husband. I don't do this often. I kind of remember the last time, once in a while. And I said, I need to go to Yossi's grave. And I went to Yossi's grave with my husband. And we usually go on the way somewhere or if it's a special day. We don't generally just go. But I went to Yossi's grave. And one of the thoughts that came to me is that people look at me and say, that's so horrible, that's so horrible. And it is. I mean, it was so much loss. But there's a sweet sad to it, which is that Yossi died and we married it right away to bring him to what we call Kever Yisrael, to a Jewish grave with dignity, surrounded by love. We knew, we knew that he died quickly. And I thought the world is hard and no one ever knows. Everybody's struggling in their own way. So it's not just in an obvious, that one I felt very, very hard because that interview was just heartbreaking. These lovely people and this beautiful 22 year old. And I can't stop thinking about Omer. I know it's just one face and one name in the hostages, but I got a very close up and personal look because of my work as a writer. Um, but the bottom line is really that anybody, sometimes we know, sometimes we don't. You meet somebody on the street and you have no idea if they're struggling with mental illness, if somebody they love is struggling with mental illness, if their marriage is on the rocks, if they're lonely, if they're angry, if they're traumatized, if what they're a victim of, we don't know. We're very, very quick to put people into boxes and say, well, at least this, well, at least that. So I think that I would just say what really worked for me is the humility that some people had to let me be, mostly my husband, really, who didn't impose his way of grieving on me and let me be in the safety of it because there's no easy answer. People ask it to me all the time. What do we do when people are hurting? Everybody's different. I'm a talker. My Elsie was a talker. My husband is not. So it doesn't help for him to talk. I can talk and talk and talk. I, I wanted to be heard. He didn't. And I could tell you that there were some days when I didn't want to talk at all. So even among, we change ourselves too, but everybody's different. So the humility to step back and say, I want to be of service to you and I don't know how. And just tell me. And that's, it's hard to do. It's hard to do because sometimes it's not natural to us. Wow, that was amazing. I actually wanted to mention while you're talking about the AMI, it came to mind, but I really enjoy your articles. I get the AMI. I, I I subscribed and I get it every week to my door and it's really, you know, some weeks I really enjoy it more some, you know, but I really enjoy your stories, how you write them because they're so real and I like real stories and um, you're a really incredible writer as well. So thank you for that. Um, I mean, I know you wear a lot of hats, so it's pretty incredible. I even asked you, I said, did you ever imagine you're going to be like this? Um, speaker one day and you're like, well, I was a teacher, so I knew I had it in me. But um, sometimes when we go through pain, sometimes we reach our real true potentials. And um, it's pretty incredible. Uh, I have a couple more questions, if that's okay. Sure. Um, who was your grandfather? What was his name? Rabbi Pekarsky. Yeah, Rabbi Pekarsky. Okay. Um, a few someone wanted to know. Another question is, and only if you're comfortable sharing, um, you mentioned that your son was engaged and it was so exciting. It was just a few weeks to his wedding. Um, what happened to his bride? Ah, okay. His bride is lovely. And I write in the book how I didn't want to lose her. I mean, generally, when we when we lose a, a, a almost daughter-in-law, you know, it's because a couple breaks up. It's very rare to lose someone who was going to marry my child. So in a way, we, we would have been the close, very close relationship. And yet we went from that to nothing. So there was a little bit of an unhealthy there on my part, which is not uncommon when we're hurting. It's just to try to grab onto um, anything that we can of the person. Thank goodness she was healthier and she had some direction and she was very appropriate. I'm not going to give her name. She's the only name in the book that's not the real name. Every other name of the book, everybody, every rabbi, every friend, I used real names, um, except for her. Not because it's a secret, people can look up and see who it is, but because she didn't want that, you know, somebody finds it before she has a chance to explain it. So I didn't, I didn't put her name, but she's lovely and I wanted to keep her. Why should I lose my almost daughter-in-law just because I lost my son? But um she she was there with us during the shiva. Um, I wrote about how devastating it was when she said goodbye. Um, 
But then she came back one more time to officially have closure with Yassi. To go to, so I think she went to his grave. She came to visit us and we said goodbye. And that was goodbye. Um, except, of course, that she she has a bunch of kids, including I think it's four sons that my husband was the Mohel and did the Brissim for her sons. But um, and so we have a it's an interesting relationship. Um, she'll always hold a very special place in my heart because she's the one who said yes to marry my son. But she's not an active part of our lives. It's an unusual relationship here because it wasn't a divorce or a breakup. It was simply a, it was a death and it wasn't a marriage. So and there are no children in common. So th there was nothing to hold on to other than the sweet sadness of, you know, what, what we wanted. And of course, you know, she's entitled and should have her own life. So while there's a warm feeling in my heart, I think I'll always have it. I, I don't really know her as a close family member. And sometimes we have to accept that. Grief comes, any anything in life come, like that's big, comes with many facets. The good things also do. And this is just one of those parts that we've had to accept. But the fact that my husband was able to do the circumcisions for his sons and nobody you know, crossed any lines, we've all, we all understand this was a piece. They had to meet soul work. She had to meet Yossi. They had to agree to be married. That's all that was necessary there. We had to meet her lovely family. It was almost unnatural how easily the wedding preparations were going to, you know, and it was just a beautiful time. And it was time to let that go. That's part of life. But I will always have a warm spot for her. And we're friendly. There was never any official other than a goodbye, but no real official relationship right now. She has her own in-laws and she has her own life. Wow. That's special. And thanks for sharing that because it's something so personal, but I, I'm sure so many people had that question as well. Um, I want to thank you so much. And I want to give you a breath. I want to give you a blessing um, end off by saying that I really hope Mashiach comes so soon in your honor. So you can truly, truly be full again, um, full with your, your children, not just on a spiritual relationship and not just on a soul relationship, but on a, on a practical and a body kind of when you can see with your own eyes kind of relationship. So I want to give you that blessing that it should happen so, so soon with the coming of Mashiach. And um, we all need to make Mashiach come, meaning how do we do that by adding more acts and acts of goodness and kindness into this world? I know I said this before, but I'll just repeat it again because it's so good. But this woman came to the Rebbe and she was screaming and she said, you need to bring Mashiach. My child was taken from me. It's a very, very emotional video to watch. And the Rebbe looked at her and at first he, he was spoke to her very calmly. And he said, it's up to us to bring Mashiach. We all have to do our part. And she was screaming and screaming. So he had to speak the language that she understood. And he said, I did everything I can to bring Mashiach everything and he did the rubber did everything he can he literally gave us everything he he could have done he could have kept his he could have kept everything to himself like all his special gifts and no one would have known and had a lovely wife a lovely life with his special wife the rabbits and chaya mushka and he could have you know taken the path of being an engineer anything he wanted he was brilliant but he chose to give us his everything everything. And we really owe it to him. And we need to bring Mashiach. In fact, I was in an, like in a taxi in Israel. And um, now everyone wants to speak, everyone's friends. And um, this guy was talking and he's like, yeah, when's Mashiach going to come? And I said, we have to bring it. And he, he wasn't hearing it. And then I was like, listen, you need to bring Mashiach. It's not just going to come me and you and you and you. I said, what are you doing? And I was a little bit like pushy. And I'm like, come on, we have to do something to bring Mashiach. We need our hostages home. We need Mashiach to come. Let's make it happen. And um, I was like, will you get someone to wrap to fill in? And he looked at me. I don't know if he puts fill in on himself, but he, he, he got it. And he, he he's it's just interesting how some of us are wired um as givers and some of us are wired as takers and um in order for Mashiach to come we need to give to get it's not just going to come it's not it's not happening Hashem needs all of our help to make it happen so we need to do work 
Now it could be work like spiritual work, go out there, ask people if they're Jewish, get them to add more light into the world, give them candles, get people to wrap to fill in, um, tzedakah boxes, mezuzah for protection. But the hardest work that we have to do, and um, someone once asked me what I think will bring Mashiach is we have to do our work and we have to fix ourselves. In order to fix the world, we have to fix ourselves. And we only know, we know what we need to fix. We know our pluses and minuses. We know um, our our shortcomings and we need to fix that because the it says that the generation generation of Mashiach is gonna suffer a lot, which we are. And the generation of Mashiach, we have to fix the past generation. So we have to fix our ancestors, anything that they didn't fix. And there was a lot that they didn't fix. And we have a lot to handle. And that's why this generation is all about anxiety and fears. And we're going through so much of that. And it's really hard. But um, if we connect to Torah, it makes the journey easier. Now, if you want to connect to outside sources, it's just like a much longer journey of healing and help. And But if we literally go with the GPS, Torah is our GPS, and it's literally our char charging stations. I told this to my sister, and she's like, oh, that's so good. You should really tell everyone. But when you have an iPhone and when you have an Android, if you take the iPhone charger and plug it into the Android, it doesn't work. And if you take the iPhone charger and charge it, charge it into the Android charger, that won't work either. And if you take whatever the Samsung, every charging station has something and our, our neshama, our Jewish soul needs Torah. And um, all the other things are great, but it's not for us. We need Torah in our life to charge our neshamas and um, we need to connect more and we need to do the work. So ladies, and gentlemen, for those that are listening, let's make it happen. And we must make it happen. We owe it to our loved ones. And we owe it to our, our loved ones that we want to come back with Mashiach. And we owe it to our, the Rebbe because he did so much for us. Now it's time to give back and do for him. So whatever work that is, let's do it. And I hope next week we'll all celebrate with the coming of Mashiach in person because people ask me all the time do you do this in person and I'm like unfortunately no because like you saw we have the whole world that's on this class um and it's just hard but when Mashiach comes we won't be limited to a space um and where we live so let's really make that happen and I want to thank Devori Kreiman for being on with us tonight and sharing with us your personal journey, which is hard, like you said, in the beginning, years ago, no one shared. Today, I think it's the work of Mashiach to share in a healthy space and to, to share um, with the world so people can learn and to know what to do. And we're very lucky today. The Lubavitcher Rebbe really wanted everyone to get a spiritual mentor, which is a Mashpia. And by getting a spiritual mentor, it just really helps guide us in life. So if you're going through something hard in life, you can discuss it with someone and have an, a listening ear. And I love, love, love your friend that said, shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> um, so great. Um, not always appropriate, but um, in that case for you, it was, but only a good friend knows what to say. So everyone find a friend that they can relate to. And um, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank the ambassadors of the class. We share the class weekly. I want to thank all of the viewers from the class for coming on. I want to thank Shandy Jacobson from the class, my Mashpia for the class, my spiritual mentor of the class. Thank you so much. I want to thank my husband who really helps me so much with this class, uh, all the tech and uploading it on YouTube. Uh, it, it takes time. So I'm very grateful and thankful to him um, for that. And I want to just thank all the sponsors for this class, everyone that sponsored this class in honor of everyone and you guys should be blessed. And I want to thank just Hashem and the Rebbe for this opportunity. So have a blessed night and we'll see you next week. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Thank you.